back to Black Oak Baptist Church on a Sunday night. We want to start. You just follow, stand up and follow along on the screen. Victory in Jesus, right? Amen. What a great way to start a Sunday night. Amen. I heard an old you pick a song tonight. Now, I know they'll play it. I don't know that I can sing it, but anybody got a song out there, we're going to try this tonight. So, anybody, give me a song. Heaven's Jubilee. Heaven's Jubilee. I'm, Braden, can you find that up there? <clears throat> I think it's about 112 now, that old red back coming or something. Yeah. Is it 110? Okay, I was off a couple pages. That's the way I go in life. I'm off a couple pages everywhere I go. <laughs> Hold on, let's see. Let Braden see if he can find it. I know it, but I won't give Braden a chance to find it because there's a lot of people maybe don't know it. Hey, there it is. It's an old, it's a red. It's a, yeah, here we go. Let's try this. Some that morning we shall see Jesus in the air. Come and I to you and me, joy is ours to share. Who are rejoicing that will be with the saints shall cry. And if for that you believe under in the sky. Oh, 
Anybody got another? We'll try one more. Oh, what a Savior. Well, no, where's Beverly at? She ain't here. All right, we'll sing it. We'll put it up for Oh, what a Savior. Amen. It's a great song. Amen. said amen amen give the lord a big round of applause now. amen brother tom and brother rock is going to continue to play thank you for helping out now you step out shake someone's hand now welcome to church would you do that
that singing tonight say amen. amen amen take your bibles to acts chapter 27 tonight acts chapter 27 tonight i want to share with you tonight about weathering the storms of life how many of you know that there's storms and trials that we must face and that we must encounter on this side of heaven one preacher said you're either going into a storm you're in a storm or you're coming out of a storm they are not avoidable in the Christian life especially when you are living the life that the Lord Jesus has called you to live tonight with the help of the Lord I want to help you about how you can weather those storms of life would you stand with me if you can tonight as we read Acts chapter 27 begin reading in the 13th verse if you love your Bible say amen the Bible said, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose it against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. One preacher said that was the problem. They let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Claudia, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing, lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. And listen here, we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was taken away. Have you ever felt like that? But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and have not loosed from Crete. Then to have gained this harm and loss, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and, lo, God hath given them all that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. And it shall be even as it was told me. How be it we must be cast upon a certain island? But when the fourteenth night was come, and as we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. 
and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon the rock, listen now, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, but Paul besought them to take meat, saying, This is the fourteenth day that you've carried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall be not a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had spoken thus, he took bread, and he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. Lord, I thank you for the songs that were sung tonight. Lord, I thank you for the old-timey songs, Lord, that the men and women of God wrote, Lord, that we can still worship today with. Lord, I thank you that there's coming a day when every single storm on our radar will disappear. I thank you, Lord, that there's coming a day when there'll be no more sorrow and there'll be no more sickness and there'll be no more pain that we have to bear. Lord, I thank you that there's coming a day for all of eternity that we can spend around the throne worshiping you. But, Lord, I understand tonight that I'm preaching to people who are weathering the storms of life. I understand tonight that I'm preaching to people who are in the place where they feel like all hope is gone. Lord, where they feel like any chance of healing and any chance of hope is no longer there. Lord, I pray tonight that you'd use me as your vessel to speak into their life, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, that they might find comfort and hope in the Word of God tonight. May we leave here encouraged as we start this new year. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated tonight. Leave your Bible open. Very familiar passage of Scripture. and Many of you say, preacher, you ought not joke like that, but the Bible said that laughter does good like a good medicine. I'm thankful tonight that we have the Word of God, aren't you? I found myself in my life in many different storms, Brother Don. I found myself weathering the things of life that I never thought that I would weather. And I've preached from this passage several times before. One of my favorite passages in the book of Acts. But I want to show you some things tonight that the Lord showed me that I've never seen before. If you study where they are, you know when we studied through the book of Acts that Paul has appealed to appear before Caesar because Felix and Festus and Agrippa would not hear what he was trying to say. And as a Roman citizen, he had the, uh, the right to appeal before Caesar. And he's on this journey to go, and you read prior in Acts 27, and they, he's put under the charge of a man named Julius. And Julius gives Paul leave and allows him that he may go out and refresh himself every time they stop, and they're about to sail in the winter seasons of their life. And Paul tells them, it is not good for us to sail right now. You remember when Paul's in prison in 2 Timothy and he tells Timothy to do his best to come before winter? The very reason is that in those months when winter would set in, it was virtually impossible to travel by the way of water. And he tells them, we do not need to loose from Crete or I know some damage is going to come. Well, they follow anyways and they don't listen to the words of Paul. And in verse number 14, it said that there arose a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. That word Eurocladon, it means a violent agitation. They gave this storm a name to fit what would happen. And to set your mind in it, Paul is a prisoner on the ship in the middle of the will of God. Paul has done nothing wrong since the Lord has transferred him from darkness to light, from Saul to Paul. He has done nothing but try to advance the kingdom of God. He's done nothing but faithfully proclaim to people that there is a risen Savior in the world today and that I know that he's living because the Apostle Paul knew that he lived inside of him. I don't know what else he's struggling with. He would tell us later in 2 Corinthians that he had a thorn in his flesh that the Lord would not remove. But can I say this tonight? Dear, dear friend, hear me. If you are in a storm, it doesn't mean it's because you've done something wrong. 
Now, sometimes God will send the storm of his judgment to chastise his child when we get out of line. But there are times that God wants to teach us things in the valleys of life that we cannot learn upon the mountain. There are things that the Lord wants to teach us in the dark storms of life that we can't learn when everything's going well for us. And Paul tells them not to loose into the sea, but they do it anyways. And they get there, and the Bible said in verse number 18 that they were exceedingly tossed about in the tempest. I'm talking about a storm big enough to move that big cargo ship, that boat that they were traveling on. Can you imagine where being where Paul is and you're in the center of the will of God only to face one of the darkest storms that you've ever faced in your life? I wonder if the apostle Paul wondered like we do sometimes, Lord, why am I here? Lord, where are you at? But I'm glad for what the Apostle Paul did. He told him in verse number 22 to be of good cheer for no man would lose their life. Paul was not the only prisoner on that ship. And he tells them in verse number 23 what God will do for you in every storm of our life if we'll trust him. He said, for there stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve. You know who the angel of God is? The same person who the angel of the Lord is in the Old Testament. It was Jesus standing right beside Paul. How many of you are glad that though you may have to go through storms in this life, that Jesus stands right beside you? I was thinking about those, and I'm going to try to preach tonight if you'll help me and pray for me, but I was thinking about those disciples as they were in the middle of that sea and experienced fishermen that knew the Sea of Galilee, experienced fishermen that knew what it was like to go through those storms in that place where they could come just like that, uh, and they got into that second storm uh, and they began to cry out. They thought their lives were over. They thought their ministry was over. Can I say that the devil has got me into places sometimes uh, where I thought everything was done and that there was no reason to keep going uh, and they looked out over on the water over yonder and there was a man walking and they cried out in fear and said it's a ghost uh, and he got a little bit closer and Peter said no, 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 no. That's Jesus and he's walking on the water. We criticize Peter a lot of times for falling under the water but he was the only one that recognized Jesus and got out of the boat with him. I'm glad tonight that though I have to endure the storms of life, that my lifeguard still walks on water and has the ability to say, peace be still. Paul said, the angel of God stood by me, but that wasn't all he did. It'd be enough for us if Jesus just stand with us. We sung it this morning that we can't even walk without him holding our hand. But I like what the angel of God said unto Paul in verse 24. He said, fear not, Paul. Can I tell you what the devil wants you to do when the storms of life come? Brother John, he wants you to be afraid. But can I remind you that Paul told Timothy, for God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Friend, in the storms of life, you don't have to be afraid because the angel of God stands right with you. And I'm getting to where I'm going. And he said in verse number 25, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. And it shall be as even as it was told unto me. Paul goes from the place in verse number 20 of saying that there was not neither sun nor stars in the sky. What does that mean? It was not only a storm in his life, but it was dark. In that day, they didn't have the lights that we do. And he said, the apostle Paul said, all hope that we should be saved was taken away from them. Friend, if you're in that place tonight and you feel like, preacher, there's no way I can keep going. Uh, preacher, I don't even know where Jesus is right now. Uh, I I haven't felt his presence in a long time. I haven't felt that he's with me. I can't say today that I know that he walks with me and he talks with me because I have no idea where he is. Sometimes in the storms of life, the master of the sea is silent so that we can learn. Charles Spurgeon said, Brother Rocky, I've learned to kiss the waves of adversity that slammed me into the rock of ages. Somebody say amen right there. The apostle Paul went from saying there was no hope that we were going to make it out of this to just a few minutes later to say him the angel of God stood by me this night and said you don't have to be afraid and what did Paul say I believe God can I ask you a question tonight do you believe what these 66 books say do you believe what he says to you that I'll never leave you nor forsake you to be strong and courageous for it is the Lord thy God uh, that doeth go before you we have so many promises tonight uh, that he will never leave our side even in the darkest valleys of life Paul tells those men you can be of good cheer 
because I believe God. And about that time, they start to get close. They've already wrecked once onto an island. They've undergirded the ship. They've repaired it. They begin to sail again. Uh, and now they see another island that's uh, very close to them. And the, the Bible said that they sounded. What does that mean? They threw a lead weight into the water. And they would count how long it took it for it to hit the bottom. And they'd hear it hit the bottom. And they would know how close they were to shore. Uh, and they purposed that they were close enough. And they threw out the four anchors to hold the ship. They threw out those anchors as they were worried that they were about to crash into land. But I like what happens. Look at verse number 30 in your Bible. It said, as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down a boat into the sea, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. The Lord showed me two things to show you tonight of how you can weather the storms of life. The first thing is, is you've got an anchor. Anybody glad that you've got an anchor? That old song that Ray Bolt used to sing, the anchor holds in spite of the storm. And I began to think about they got a little bit close to that shore and they thought surely that they were going to wreck and it would destroy everything. And they threw out four anchors out of the boat. But can you imagine in your mind as those other men were trying to escape and they were lowering down one of the little dinghies boats that they were going to get in and escape and the apostle Paul said except you abide in this ship you cannot survive Uh, do you know why they could not survive in the other ship Uh, because it was not anchored like the main ship was Uh, can I say to you tonight the only way uh, that you will endure the storms of life uh, is to stay anchored to the master of the sea Uh, I'm encouraged about what the writer of Hebrews said uh, in Hebrews chapter number 6 In verse number 18, he said that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation. Does that mean strong encouragement? uh, Who have fled for the refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Listen to this. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, uh, both sure and steadfast, uh, and that which entereth into the veil. Uh, I'm thankful tonight, Brother Tommy, that I am anchored within the veil. Uh, These men had a physical physical anchor that was keeping them from crashing. Uh, They had a physical anchor that was keeping them from destruction. Uh, But I'm glad I've got a spiritual anchor, Brother Don, that's protecting me tonight. Uh, You know, the only way to weather the storms of life uh, is to stay in the boat uh, that's anchored in the throne of God. Uh, You know what the difference is and what the writer of Hebrews is saying? Uh, Comparing the law of Moses to the law of Christ. uh, And he's telling those people that are on the verge of reverting to Judaism that it's better to serve the law. Lord. Uh, and he said that we have an anchor that's entered into the veil. Uh, in the Old Testament times, uh, that veil was the place where the high priest would go on Yom Kippur. Uh, only one time a year could he appear in the presence of God. Uh, and all of Israel would wait for that high priest uh, in October of our calendar to go into that place so that they could have hope. Uh, that's what they had to wait for one day a year. But I am glad tonight, uh, and I feel like preaching tonight when I think about it, that I'm anchored within to the veil. What does that mean? Uh, When Jesus died upon the cross uh, and he said it is finished. uh, The veil was ripped from top to bottom. Symbolizing whoever wanted to, Brother Paul, could come into the presence of God. Uh, Whoever wanted to could get as close to the master as they needed to. And I'm glad tonight Brother Roger, my anchor's not moving. uh, But I'm anchored to the very throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, And no matter what may come, uh, no matter the storms of life that rage, uh, he will hold me fast aren't you glad tonight they waited one day a year just to know that they had hope but we wake up every day of the year and today the first day of the year what better thing for me to tell you than you have hope even in the storms of life you know why you do because the writer of hebrews would go on to say that he's unmovable he would go on to say that he's unchangeable that he's the same God, that he's the same God yesterday, he's the same God today, he's the same God tomorrow, he's the same God he's always been, and he'll always be the same God that he has been. And because he does not change, dear friend, you can have hope in the storms of life. Can I tell you tonight that he knows exactly what you're going through? The very one that said, let there be light and created everything. The very one that came as a baby born of a virgin in Bethlehem one Christmas night. 
The very one that walked the Via Dolorosa and died in my place and your place, laid down his life as the sacrificial lamb for us. The very one that got out of the grave by his own power three days later. The very one that suffered like we do, that the writer of Hebrews said, we do not have a high priest uh, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That very same Jesus knows what you're facing tonight. And he knows that you feel like, verse 20, that all hope's been taken away, that you could be saved. Paul told those men, your only hope of weathering this storm and surviving. He told them, except you abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. It's easy in our flesh to run when storms come. Somebody say amen. It's easy to distract our mind when storms come. It's easy... I told Haley earlier this week, I said, I feel like Elijah. I just want to lay under the juniper tree, and I don't want nobody to bother me, and I want to stay here for a while. It's easy to get into that mindset. It's easy to get into the place of Jeremiah and come home and say, There's, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not serving God anymore. But he knows even when we are in those moments. And A.W. Tozer said it's in our darkest hours that God will do his deepest work in our lives. Dear friend, be encouraged if you're in a storm tonight. Because God trusts that you can make it through that storm. And he's doing a work in you that only he can do. Paul didn't only tell them, except they abide in the ship, they cannot be saved. Then the soldiers would cut off the other boats and leave them. And they would tarry 14 days. These men had not eaten. Paul was in abstinence. The Bible said he was fasting, had nothing to eat. But can you imagine trying to eat in the middle of a storm like that? I remember one time we went on a cruise when I was in middle school. And I remember we got in such a bad storm. I'm pretty sure it was Eurachlodon. I'm pretty sure we was in that very same storm. And I remember walk, I remember being scared to death, walking down my hallway at, at night, and we was in that storm. And I mean, it's like you was walking on the, hallway, on the wall in the middle of that hallway. The storm was so bad. I can't imagine the Apostle Paul even wanting to eat, but I believe there was another reason that he was not eating. He knew where his help came from. The psalmist said, I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who's made the heavens and the earth. And then Paul sits down and he distributes meat and bread to the other men that are on the ship. Now watch this. All of the soldiers on that ship are in submission to the prisoners because he was God's man. He gives them to eat. And in verse 35, verse 34, he said, I pray you to take some meat for this is for your help. For there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. What encouragement they got in the middle of the storm. You know what else you need to do when you're weathering the storms of life? In verse 35, it said, When he had thus spoken, he took the bread, and he gave thanks to God in the presence of all of them. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. The hardest thing to do in the middle of the storms of your life is the most important thing to do in the middle of the storm of your life. Is when you're up against the wall, that song says... When you don't know what to do, when you don't know where to go, when you don't feel like it, you ought to give thanks to God. Here's the Apostle Paul. His life is turned around. He's serving the Lord, and he's in the worst storm of his life. And in the middle of it, he sits down, he breaks bread, and he gives thanks. I imagine that the Apostle Paul did not say the Baptist meal prayer. I imagine that he did not sit down, by the way, he's not eaten in 14 days. When you and I go 14 hours, thank you, Jesus, for this food. Blessed nourish my body, nourish my body. Amen. Am I right? The Apostle Paul, I imagine, sits down and he begins to thank God for his protection. Maybe he sat down and he began to thank the Lord that he had an anchor that would hold in the worst storms of life. Can I say that when you and I are in the storms of life and we decide to get better instead of bitter, that's when God will start to work. When we stop going, it's okay to ask God why. It's okay to question in the storms of your life. It's okay to wonder why things happen. It's just not okay to stay there. I imagine as Apostle Paul begins to thank the Lord, maybe he thinks about the words that Peter will write where he said, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth not, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The the apostle Peter didn't just say to rejoice when the storms of life come. And you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, through many temptations. But he said you ought to greatly rejoice. 
Can I say when you're weathering the storms of life, your greatest weapon is praise? Can you imagine the Apostle Paul sits down and he begins to thank God? Some of them other people probably wondering, what in the world is he doing? Can I ask you the storm you're in right now? When's the last time you didn't say thank you for the storm, but you said thank you that you're with me in the storm? I don't mean to use this as an illustration a lot. It's just what the Lord's teaching me. And I told you that Tozer said that God does his deepest work in our darkest hours. That's where me and Haley have been the past few months of our life. And as we sat in that, I began to learn this. When we sat in that hospital room, and I'm just sharing my heart with you, as we sat in that waiting room and the presence of God surrounded us right after we learned what happened. And I, as we got home and I began to try to pray through this, I would lie to you if I didn't tell you that I asked God why. I would lie to you if I didn't wonder in my mind, Lord, I'm serving you. I'm doing everything that you've asked me to do. I'm trying my best to live a holy life. Why would this happen? I would lie to you if I didn't go through that process. But I found myself middle way through that process that the Lord said, Matthew, if you'll just start thanking me for this situation, I'll get you out of it. And many of you are thinking tonight, preacher, I can't thank God in the middle of my trial. I can't thank God for what's come my way. But I found myself in my prayer place and the Holy Spirit making groanings that could not be uttered and I found myself brother Roger praying words like this thank you Lord for allowing me to know what it would be like for three weeks to be a dad thank you Lord that you're still able to do what the doctors aren't able to do and the moment I got to that place in my storm I began to remember that my anchor was holding I began to remember that the hand holding me was a whole lot greater than myself I began to remember that Isaiah 41 10 said fear not for the Lord thy God is with thee and he goes before thee I'm going to need somebody to help me tonight in the middle of your storm when you feel like you can't praise God is when you need to give thanks the most and it's in that very moment that he'll begin to minister to your soul and to lift your feet from that place and to give you a song to sing again can I say we're still trying to heal through that process but can I say my soul is a whole lot better, Brother David, since I got to the place where I said, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm glad that I can trust you. Through the whole thing, maybe this will help you where you're at in your storm. Through the whole thing, the Lord kept taking me back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust that there's a plaque on my desk that says it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, even in the storms of life. And he will direct your path. Are you glad your anchor holds tonight? Friend, unless you stay in the ship, you're going to perish. What's that a picture of? Stay in him. Stay in his word. Stay in prayer. Stay in worship. But you know there's something that happens when you thank God in the middle of your trials. Verse 35 said, Paul had spoken to them. He took the bread and he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. But verse number 36 said, Then were they all of good cheer, and they took some meat. These are the very same men that didn't have the same hope that Paul had. Most of them are prisoners. Most of them deserve to be prisoners. I guarantee you many of the guards did not know who Jesus was. And they're the very same men in verse number 20 that had no hope that they would be saved. Can I say that the Apostle Paul, if he had no hope he'd be saved this side of heaven, he had hope he'd be saved that side of heaven. Sometimes God will fix our storm this side of heaven, but sometimes he'll fix it that side of heaven. And I'm glad when I get over there, there'll be no more storm clouds. I'm glad when I get over there, the thunder will never roll anymore. But the only thing that we're going to hear is the praises that are coming from around the throne of God. I'm thankful that I'm headed to a land where there's no more sorrow. Dear friend, the storm will only last for a little while. But how you handle your storm it's going to affect somebody else who's going through a storm. You know what the Lord's begin to remind me this week? Same thing you've reminded Elijah. Matthew, you're not the only one going through things today. You, you ever got up and felt sorry for yourself? You can say amen right there. Have you? You ever been getting ready and you just felt sorry for your whole situation? And the Lord only remind me about people in our church who are struggling. Can I say we need to pray for Brother William? He lost Robin. He lost his mama and he just lost his brother-in-law. People going through cancer. People going through that little 20-year-old boy going through things, been in the hospital for 14 months. 
people facing things that we've not even got close to facing. But you know what happens in the middle of your storm? What God will do if you'll begin to thank Him for it? He'll begin to use it for His glory. Here are all these people that had no hope they'd be saved. And they're just following what Paul's saying because he's saying some encouraging stuff. He's saying some authoritative stuff that God stood by him in the middle of the night and said, I'm with you, Paul, and you can trust me. And Paul said, I believe God. And these people are listening to him. And they go from having no hope to remaining in the ship where their anchor holds to hearing Paul give thanks. And then they're all of good cheer. Did you know as a Christian, when you walk around like this, nobody else is going to want what you got. When you're a Christian and you know Jesus and you claim to, you got the t-shirt that says it, you wear the necklace, the bumper stickers on your car, and everybody knows that you're a Christian and you walk around defeated 24-7, it's only going to discourage other people. But if you'll walk around, no matter what's coming your way, and you'll say, I'm, I'm not telling you, you've got to say, God, thank you what for what is happening. The Bible did not say, for all things give thanks, but the Bible said, in all things give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And the very storm you're in tonight is His very will for your life, that He might mold you and make you into who He ought to be. Uh, every one of us tonight are facing something in some form or fashion, but Jesus wants to move in and work in your way to help somebody else. Does it change perspective that the storm's bigger than you? That if you decide and purpose in your heart to thank God, it might bring joy to somebody else. They all had courage now. I want to read you what happens in the remainder of the chapter. In verse number 37, it said, All that were in the ship were 203 score and 16 souls. Look how many people the Apostle Paul encouraged. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, and they cast out the wheat into the sea. Can I show you this? Last of all tonight, Lord just showed it to me. They didn't know how God was going to get them out of that storm. They just had a promise that he would get them out of the storm. They got to the place where they filled up their bellies and threw over all their food so that they could better control the ship. Verse 39, when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded if it were possible to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoist up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with violence of waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. Can you imagine? They had a promise that God would get them out of the storm. But they didn't have the way he would get them out of the storm. They didn't know how he would get them out of the storm. Can I tell you tonight that you've got a promise that your lifeguard walks on water? I can't tell you that tomorrow God will get you out of your storm. I can't tell you that tonight if you come and pray at an altar that God will get you out of your storm. But I can tell you that we have the promise that He is an ever-present help in a time of trouble. Can I give you a promise? God's had me camping out in the book of Psalms in chapter number 34 lately. Let me give you three promises as I close today. Psalm 34, verse 7, listen to it. It said, the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and he <clears throat> delivereth them. Here's your promise tonight. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. But the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. It'll go on to say, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Uh, that, is your, that is your promise that Paul had, uh, that God will get you out of the storm. Uh, you may not know how God will get you out of the storm. Uh, you probably won't know how God will get you out of the storm until he gets you out of the storm. Uh, and the apostle Paul didn't need to know the how. Uh, he didn't need to know the why. Listen to me tonight. Because he knew the who. Somebody say amen. Uh, he knew that God... God had made a promise uh, that he would get him out of that place. Uh, and can you imagine they pull the anchors back up on board uh, and they sail for that little creek that's between two islands uh, and they run ashore into it and the front part of the ship sticks and the back breaks into a million pieces. 
I imagine all of them again thought, surely we're going to die. Hey, can I ask you a question, honestly? Have you ever been in a storm where you felt like you started to get some help and then all of a sudden you felt like there was no hope again? You ever been in a place where you felt like Jesus was right there coming to rescue you, but he only got you halfway out of that pit you were stuck in? There's a purpose in that tonight. And all of the prisoners had the opportunity to escape. And the centurion, the guards were going to kill the prisoners because it was their life or theirs if they escaped. But the centurion listened to the words of Paul and he said, do them no harm. And they commanded all that could swim to jump into the sea and swim to land. But look at verse 44, and I'm done tonight. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they all escaped safe to land. Can I tell you tonight, I don't know what storm you're going through, but he does. I don't know the things that you're facing in your private life, but he does. I don't have the ability, Rocky, to get you out of the storm, but he does. I'm glad tonight that he knows exactly how to deliver you. Preacher, what must I do weathering this storm? Stay in the boat where you're anchored within the veil. Stay in a place of giving thanks unto God and trying to help somebody else in the middle of your storm. And you don't have to know how he'll do it, but you'll know when he'll do it. Brother Tommy and Rocky, will you help me please? Can you imagine as all of them are in that place of certain peril? Can you imagine for those that didn't know how to swim? Those that knew how to swim jumped in the water and they was at land, they were safe. But they had to jump in and swim around that rubbish that was in the water. But can you imagine those that didn't know how to swim? Can you imagine they, they probably thought, Brother Roger, how are we going to get out of this? We, we got no way out of it. We know, Paul, we know God gave you a promise, but I just can't see how he's going to do it. Maybe that's where you're at tonight. But God made the providence that some of them made it on broken pieces of the ship, Brother John. Some of them made it floating on the flagpole that broke off the ship. Others on just little tiny little boards. And they all floated safely to land. And God delivered every single one of them from the worst storm that they've ever experienced. Maybe tonight you're in the worst storm you've ever experienced. Maybe you say, preacher, I just came out of a storm and I'm right back in a storm. I feel like I can't catch a break. I feel like there's a storm everywhere I go. I feel like the Lord started to help me, but then I feel like he's gone again. Friend, can I encourage you tonight to keep trusting his promise that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Every head bowed, every eye closed tonight before we sing. I wonder if somebody here would be honest and say, Preacher, I'm struggling to keep going. Preacher, I just don't think I can make it another day. I'm ready to give up. I wonder if anybody tonight feels like all hope that you would be saved is gone. Friend, if that's you, there's help tonight, and I'd invite you to come. I'd invite you to put your trust in the Lord again and say, Lord, help me to remember your promise. Lord, help me to trust in you with all of my heart. Lord, help me to remember that my anchor will hold no matter what will come. And Lord, help me to give you thanks even in the middle of the storm. Friend, there's help tonight if you just obey the Lord in this invitation time and ask him to help you. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to be in your house in this place. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the promises that you've made us, God, even in the storms of life. And I pray you'd remind us that our anchor holds. I pray, Lord, that you'd remind us that you're an ever-present help in a time of trouble. God, I pray you'd help us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to our feet, as we sing, if you need to come, would you come? Lord, help me through this storm. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh
Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the power. Tommy and Rocky continue to play. Would you just bow your head right there? The Lord knows the storm you're going through tonight. Maybe you can't get up here. Maybe you feel like you can't even get to Him tonight. Just right before we go home, right there, would you just ask Him to help you? Would you just ask Him to give you the strength that only He can? Help. Ask Him to help you weather the storm. He's there to help you tonight, friend. He's there to carry the heavy load if you just let him. Father, thank you for this time tonight in your house. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for being our help in a time of trouble. Lord, I pray as we start this new year, as we go through this day, God, as we go through this week, I pray we'd be ever mindful of your presence in our lives. Lord, we love you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anybody have anything on your heart tonight? Let me give you just an announcement real quick, and then we will leave. Just to remind you, the church office will be closed tomorrow uh, for New Year's, the day to observe that holiday. Um, I told you that we will not have Wednesday morning prayer meeting until April, and the reason that we are doing that, the Lord has called me to call our church to a time of prayer. There is many things going on that we need to pray for. We need to pray for revival. We need to pray for personal struggles. We need to pray for ourselves. We need to pray for our world and for other churches. You say, preacher, that don't make sense. Then why are you canceling prayer meetings? Because until the Lord tells me so, on Wednesday nights we're not going to sing. I'm not going to preach. We're just going to pray. And now some of you might wonder, well, what's the point of even coming? Because there's power in God's people praying together. And I hope that you will seek in your heart and that God will challenge your heart that we need to pray. And how we are going to do it is at the start of every Wednesday night service, God willing, at least for the first few Wednesdays, I'm going to share scripture on prayer. I'm not going to preach, not going to share a devotional. And then we are just going to spend time praying. And then when you feel like you're done praying I'll just ask you just to leave quietly some people might pray for 10 minutes some people might pray for over an hour however long God leads you to pray but I feel like we are about we got a lot of things going on we need to pray for we're vision teams working we're about to remodel this sanctuary we need God's guidance on a whole lot of things and we need God to do something in our church that nobody can do but him how many of you would love to walk in on a Sunday morning again and as we worship and people are raising their hands and shouting and glad to be at church and seeing people get help on the altar, seeing people get saved on the altar. How many of you would like to see that again? You know how that comes? By prayer. Charles Spurgeon says prayer, that the prayer is the hand that moves the world. There's still nothing too hard for God, but we have not because we ask not. So Wednesday night, I'm going to ask you to come in just quietly, reverently, and we'll start. And then we'll pray wherever you feel like praying on the altar in your pew. And then as you're done praying, you'll just exit quietly, and we're going to believe God to do something through it, okay? So I challenge you to be here. There is a basket on this front table. Let me say this, and you can go home. I'm going to leave this here. There are pencils here, and there are note cards here. Instead of verbally taking prayer requests, when we come in on Wednesday nights, you can do this on Sunday night. You can do it on Sunday morning whenever you need to. But you're going to come in, you can write your prayer request on that card, and I want you to put it in this basket. The Lord knows what that need is, but the reason I'm doing that, God has challenged me as a pastor 
to pray more for your needs. And that will help me to know how to pray for you. Is everybody on board with doing that? I hope so. That's what we're going to do. So please be here Wednesday night at 6 if you can, okay? And let's pray and let's believe that God can still do something in this day and in this day. I guarantee you it's going to change how we worship on Sundays if we'll take time to pray on Wednesday. All hearts and minds clear anything on your heart. If not, Happy New Year. I love each and every one of you. Be careful going home. Good night and God bless you.